Imagine we were gonna do something strange, like draw a triangle, that's not the weird part. Let the base of that triangle be one, also not so strange, but let the height of that triangle be pi. Now maybe that doesn't seem that strange initially, but imagine we wanted to figure out the measure of the angle toward the origin there, whether we're in coordinate plane space or complex plane space or whatever. We would say, for example, tangent of that angle theta is equal to pi over one, opposite over adjacent, right? The measure of the side opposite this angle right now is pi, the measure of the adjacent side is one, and it's awfully strange to end up with a pi not inside the tangent, not inside the argument, but rather as the result of the tangent, or really for that matter, the result of any other trigonometric function. In fact, if we tried to figure out this angle right now, we would do something like take the inverse tangent on each side, and so we would get theta equals the inverse tangent of pi itself. And again, pretty strange for pi to be the argument of the inverse tangent function. Pi and its multiples are more typically the result of the inverse tangent function. Well, as you can probably tell, this result is related to Euler's identity, the most beautiful formula in all of mathematics, e to the i pi plus one equals zero. It is e to the i pi week over here at Polymathematic HQ. Today, we are going to look at a special limit involving the inverse tangent function that is going to help us better understand what on earth e to the i pi plus one equals zero can possibly mean. So the reason this matters is that if I'm in complex space, my left right axis is telling me a real number and my up and down axis is telling me an imaginary number. So this triangle here with a base of one, and you can see I've cut the height in half to pi over two, in some sense can represent for us the complex number one plus pi i over two. But you can see I've got two different triangles here. What we're going to do is increase those number of triangles and see if we can figure out where this point all the way to the left ends up in complex space. But to be able to do that, we want to justify what's going on with this angle. As I increase these number of triangles, isn't it at some point just gonna spiral all the way around the complex plane, never really ending up at any particular location? So this is where a limit is gonna come into play. So again, consider what you might think of as the first scenario, just a single triangle. We have a height of pi, we have a length across the triangle of one. We can type this into something like Desmos, inverse tangent of pi itself. Oh, let's do this in degrees. And we can see that's about a 72 degree angle. But now let's cut the height of that triangle in half. Let's make it pi over two, but we're going to use two of the triangles. What we wanna see is where does this angle end up now? When we cut the height in half, does that also cut the angle in half? And so basically these triangles are never gonna grow which we can obviously see is not the case, or do they actually end up growing too much, which means as I add more and more triangles on, it's just gonna rotate throughout some kind of coordinate plane or complex plane. In this particular case, again, if we called this theta, we can see now that theta is gonna be equal to the inverse tangent of pi over two over one, which of course is just pi over two. And so when we go back into our calculator, we can take the inverse tangent of pi over two, and we can see theta is now a 57-ish degree angle. So when I draw a second similar triangle on top of that original triangle, I'm now going through two times theta. Two times 57 degrees equals about 114 degrees of my coordinate plane or complex plane space. What we want to figure out in general is what happens as we do this n number of times where n increases toward infinity. This ends up being related to the definition of E. That is, we want to say, okay, if we take this theta, which again is always going to be equal to the inverse tangent of some portion of pi, in this case we'll say pi over n, we're going to divide pi up into smaller and smaller bits, but we have n of those triangles, so that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 of those triangles when we let the height be pi over eight, for example, what should we expect to happen for this particular total sum of degrees? What is it going to be approaching? In limit notation, we can write about it this way. What we're interested in is the limit as n gets infinitely large, n times the inverse tangent of pi over n, trying to show that this does converge to some particular value. If we attempted to literally just plug in infinity right now, we would end up with a problem. The n, of course, would just be infinity, some infinitely large number, but then the inverse tangent portion, well, as we divide pi, 
up into smaller and smaller bits, we're going to get something that approaches zero. If you divide pi up into a million pieces, you're gonna have one millionth of pi. If you divide pi up into a billion pieces, it's even smaller. So in fact, at some point, it's going to be indistinguishable from zero, and the inverse tangent of zero is zero itself. So we end up with what we call an indeterminate form. To figure out the value of this limit, we have to know how is this infinity growing with respect to this zero? Are they going to balance each other out in some sense? Does the infinity grow faster? In which case, yes, we're gonna end up rotating around the coordinate plane infinitely many times. Or does the zero grow faster, which in some sense is gonna bring us back to the positive x-axis or the positive real axis? We can tell looking at the picture that that doesn't seem to be happening. In fact, we can tell as we let n get larger and larger, it seems like this angle is just the top half of the plane. That is pi radians or 180 degrees. So we're expecting that this limit is gonna end up being pi itself, but how can we show that? Once again, we're gonna end up using what's called L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule is this particular rule for limits that helps us deal with indeterminate forms. If we have a zero times infinity, infinity times zero, infinity divided by infinity, or zero divided by zero, we can use L'Hopital's rule to evaluate that limit, provided we can state the original function as actually the quotient of two functions, and provided that those functions are well-behaved in some sense, that they're not changing sign infinitely many times, that their derivatives are nice and continuous, etc., etc. The first step is that we're going to take this limit and we're going to restate it as a quotient. We'll keep the inverse tangent part in the numerator of the limit, but then this n portion here, we're going to turn into division by its reciprocal. That is, we're going to divide by one over n. You can see now that if we plug infinity in for n, that is, if we let n get infinitely large, we end up with, once again, zero for the inverse tangent function. Pi divided by some infinitely large number is zero, and the inverse tangent of zero is also zero. But now our denominator also evaluates to zero. One over some infinitely large number gets infinitely close to zero. This means that we can now go ahead and apply L'Hopital's rule, so we are going to take the derivative with respect to n on both the numerator and denominator of this function. We are gonna have to use the chain rule for our numerator because the argument of that inverse tangent function isn't just x or something like that on its own, it is pi over n. The derivative of inverse tangent is one over whatever the argument is squared, so in this case that's gonna be pi squared over n squared, but again we have to take the derivative of pi over n, and so remember that's where we wanna use something like the power rule. Pi divided by n is the same thing as pi times n to the negative first, and so when we apply the power rule, that's going to be negative pi times n to the negative second, or what we can write as negative pi over n squared. For our denominator, one over n, again, we would use the power rule, and you can tell pretty easily that's gonna be negative one over n squared. So now a couple interesting things start to happen. Our negative signs cancel out. The over n squared portions cancel out. And what we're left with is the limit as n grows to infinity of pi, one times pi is pi, divided by one plus pi squared over n. Now this time, as we plug in infinity, the pi squared over infinity, pi is just a constant, so the numerator's not growing at all, that turns into zero. One plus zero is of course one, and so this whole thing evaluates to pi which is precisely what we were expecting to happen based on our picture here, based on what happens as we use n of these similar triangles, n of those angles theta, but we keep dividing up that angle pi over two, over three, over five, over 10, as small as we want. So there you have it. We have demonstrated using L'Hopital's rule that this particular expression does approach a number. In fact, it approaches pi, which is going to help us when we get to figuring out what on earth is going on with e to the i pi plus one equals zero, the most beautiful formula in all of mathematics. If you're interested in seeing that video and you're not already subscribed, go ahead and subscribe. That is coming later on this week. Like, do all the things to this video if it has been helpful, and I will see y'all next time.